Hi everyone, welcome to another Chem Complete lecture. This one I'm going to keep fairly short, but I wanted to discuss the theory of hyperconjugation and stability in relation to carbocations. So this is a subject that comes up probably about uh, halfway through the first organic chemistry semester. It's present when you start dealing with carbocations and it's really used to explain the stability order of carbocations. So before we get into hyperconjugation, we want to discuss carbocation stability. This is something you've probably seen, you're familiar with if you've been in an organic class, especially if you've started reactions. But this is the general outline. So we say that a tertiary carbocation is going to be stabler than a secondary, which would be stabler than a primary, and then we have methyl here. All right. So if I had something that was tertiary, for instance, I'd be looking at, let's say, a tert butyl group, right? So this carbon would have three CH3s, and then you have a plus right here. And then on the opposite end of the scale, if I had a methyl, I would just have a CH3 carbocation. So the number of branching groups, specifically branching hydrocarbon groups, seem to add stability and place the carbocation near the top of the stability list. Now, while this is not a resonance lecture, it is important to note that resonance stabilized carbocations are considered to be up here in the tertiary spot. So they have very high stability when you're trying to rank whether a carbocation would be stable or not. Uh, that's really its own separate lecture. But just to give you guys a brief reminder, let's say that we had something like this. It was a CH2 double bonded to a, actually I want to make, yeah, CH and then a CH3 here, right? So if I had a carbocation here, we could shift the double bond, right? And then we could place the plus charge on this one. Now, the reason that's so stabilizing is that we are delocalizing the charge over two spots, all right? But coming back to when we don't have resonance present, the question is, what is it about these additional hydrocarbon substituents that provides stability to the carbocation? And the answer to that is hyperconjugation. So usually this term is thrown out. It's, you know, people discuss it and you'll hear your professor say, oh, this is due to hyperconjugation. And that's almost all that you'll hear about it the entire semester. And so you go, what the heck is hyperconjugation? And they say, oh, you don't need to worry about it. Just know that that's what that is. Well, hyperconjugation is not that difficult to grasp or understand. So that's what we're going to attempt to do here, right? So why is the why is the order observed? It's due to hyperconjugation. And then really what is hyperconjugation? So if we take a look at that tertiary carbocation, right? I'm going to draw this out in greater detail in a second here. But if I take a look at this, how is hyperconjugation benefiting this and what is hyperconjugation itself? So in order to do that, we're going to draw a somewhat expanded view of what's going on here. Okay, so the carbocation is trigonal planar. It has lost its tetrahedral structure when it lost that fourth bond. So this is really a grouping of atoms at approximately 120 degrees from one another, right? So if we were to come in here and look right there, we're talking about 120, and then you add them all up and you get 360 going around the carbon. But what's important is it's flat and it's planar. And because of that, it is going to be an sp2 hybridized carbon that is hosting the carbocation. And what we know about sp2, if you know or have seen my lectures on hybridization, is that that means there's an additional p orbital left behind, right? Because you can have up to sp3, and your hybridization state, the number that is associated, associated with the p, is the number of p orbitals that have been sort of dragged into that hybridization process. So you can have up to sp3, which would mean all three of your p orbitals have been utilized. But if it's sp2, like in the case of a carbocation, you are going to have a p orbital that is left behind. 
And that's important because the p orbital is going to come into alignment with some of these adjacent bonds, and that's where the stability is actually going to come from. So here's the p orbital that I drew in red, all right? And I'm going to put a plus in here. This is really an empty p orbital. Just because we are drawing a plus in here, remember that a plus means a absence of electrons, that electrons have been removed. So there is no physical type of phenomenon that's occurring. It's really just an empty p orbital that is desperately looking for electron activity to fill up that void. And it's going to find it in small amount through hyperconjugation, right? So with hyperconjugation, let's now take a look at these neighboring atoms. So now we're looking at these CH3 groups that we have right here. Now, if you draw this bond out and you put the carbon here, the carbon is going to have a tetrahedral structure from the hydrogens because this does have four bonds. And what's important here is you do have free rotation around this bond, but at any time, one of these hydrogens is going to be in alignment with the p orbital. And it is this alignment, the electrons that make up this bond right here, okay, coming into alignment with the empty p orbital, the alignment with p orbital and electrons is going to create hyperconjugation. So that is where you get this stabilizing effect, okay? And if you go through organic chemistry, you're going to find that alignment of p orbitals tends to be a very beneficial sort of phenomenon. So this is a prelude to what we would refer to as conjugation. And conjugation is when you have p orbitals that are aligned with one another and they have good overlap. And that's when you start having single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond uh, for things like benzene and, uh, you know, aromatic compounds. But hyperconjugation doesn't have multiple p orbitals overlapping as much as it has a p orbital that starts to overlap with one of these uh, hybrid bonds and the alignment between the two offers stability. So every time I can get one of these interactions, it's beneficial to the carbocation. So that means the more that I can pull out, because this is just one, if I could get another one and then another one, right? Every additional one is going to count in terms of offering stability. And so when I come here, right, I would also have a CH3, and that again would offer some level of hyperconjugation to the p orbital. And then one more time, right, as I come down here, I could get alignment with the p orbital over here. And so these dots, these alignments that we have going on here is what's really offering the hyperconjugation. So what I'm highlighting in purple right now, that's an example, that's an example, and this is an example. So as these bonds turn, one of the carbon-hydrogen bonds will be in alignment with the p orbital. And when it is, there will be not a formal donation of electrons or a formal movement of electrons like resonance, but there will be basically this stabilizing force due to proximity of electrons close to the p orbital. So these are helpful neighbors that are assisting a carbocation in need. All right now to tie this all back together, if you come back up and look at the low ranking, right? Why is the methyl in such bad shape? In fact, methyl carbocations are like unicorns. They don't exist, okay? They have trouble forming in the first place because they do not have that alignment. If you note, you just have the CH3 like this, right? Still 120 going between that. But right here, when you have your plus, you do not have anything that comes into alignment with it. There's nothing there. And that's because it requires the carbon, and then the carbon has to have the additional bond to the hydrogen in order to come into alignment with that p orbital. That's where you get hyperconjugation. So right here with the methyl, there is no hyperconjugation at all, right? And then in a primary, uh, something like an ethyl carbocation, 
if I had something like this, I would get the benefit of one partner that can hyperconjugate. So in general, we still avoid primaries. Secondaries are plausible because then we start getting two hyperconjugation partners. And then tertiary is obviously preferred because you get all three. So that is hyperconjugation as a brief overview. And that is why the order of carbocations is the way that we see it. So the tertiary outranks the secondary, the primary, and then the methyl at the end, which can never happen. It's due to this phenomenon of the bond alignment with the p orbital. That's at least what's hypothesized in current uh, research and literature. So hopefully everybody has found this useful. Remember, uh, if the video was useful, you can support the channel by liking the video, uh, becoming a subscriber. If you leave any comments, I would love to interact with you guys, and I will see you for the next lecture. Have a great day, everybody.